Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for your commitment to this awesome ministry. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Jill Zerdani. Um, we do have a few housekeeping items. Just first, I please ask that you sign in so we know who came tonight. Uh, there is literature here for everyone that you might really enjoy, very detailed and good information. Um, are there any new volunteers? Okay, we have new volunteer forms that you might want to take in case you know someone that might be interested, okay? Those are there as well. We will be videoing this um, presentation from Father Bruce tonight. And then after, I will be available for any questions regarding the new uh, ministry um, schedule pro system called MSP, okay? So here we go. We are so thankful and blessed to have Father Bruce tonight to give us time and give us his insightful uh, knowledge. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Let's go ahead and stand, please, and we'll start with an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Father, we ask your blessing on our reflections tonight. May it help to enrich our experience and our practice of our sacred ministry of proclaiming your divine word in the assembly of the faithful. And may it be a source of uh, continual renewal for each of us as we desire to grow and learn more and more fully. Uh, how to proclaim the word effectively and with faith. And we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a seat. So, uh, good evening. This is neat. I'm excited because I haven't done one of these in a long, long time. And this is, this is my wheelhouse. I like doing this kind of stuff. I do not like administration. I don't like... I have to be careful how I say this. It, I, I, I'm not saying... I, I have to, we are recording, so I better say it very carefully. Um, I enjoy my job, but I prefer doing this stuff. <laughs> How's that? Uh, and so what I'm going to share with you is going to, I'm not going to give you the whole history of lecturing or a lot of the, there'd be some theology, some spirituality. I want to get, I want to get a base, a baseline for us in terms of what the church says about lecturing. Um, and then sort of the recent history, I'm not going to go throughout, you know, through the entire history, just the recent history of lecturing and why it's so essential to the, uh, to the, to the, the order of mass that we celebrate today. And then we're going to launch into some, some more uh, detailed uh, things as well. So, and I'm going to be talking from my own perspective and understand as I go through this, because I'm sure as we go along, I'm going to try and provide time for a little Q&A at the end. And so you may have particular questions about, well, should we bow or not bow? Where do we face? Those sorts of things. Um, I, I leave that, I defer that to you as a community in conjunction with your soon to arrive pastor and how you want to uh, shape that. I recognize too that now there's a rather small number of lectors here tonight. Uh, and that's something that I would be um, uh, talking to uh, Father Reader about because as a pastor, I always insisted that all of our liturgical ministers had to be renewed on a regular basis. And if they didn't show up for the renewal session, then we just took them off the list. <laughs> it works, you know. And then if they want to get back on the list, they got to make up the meeting. So that way everybody's kept up to date, you know, because I know from past experience in various places that. Uh, that people are formed and trained at various times and stages, and sometimes a lector that was trained by so-and-so 20 years ago got a different perspective than maybe somebody that trained them 10 years later or so and so forth. Uh, not that any of those are wrong. A lot that we're going to, that you may be thinking about as far as technical things, uh, those are more about perspective and emphasis. And so, in general, and this is a very broad brushstroke, in general, the pastor or the administrator of the parish is the liturgist for the parish, and he has a lot of leeway within the general instruction for the Roman Missal to adapt things according to what works best in your particular worship space, uh, because not everything works exactly the same in every single sanctuary. Things are laid out differently, so you have to do things a little bit differently. So I'm not going to worry about that tonight. Um, and just realize that uh, you may have... Uh, certain things that were emphasized with one 
instructor, and maybe maybe you're going to hear something a different perspective from me. Realize that uh, there are a lot of ways of approaching this, and it's not that one approach is right or wrong. It's just a matter of understanding where people are coming from, and also to recognize that what I'm going to talk about tonight, we're going to lay the foundation for what the church says. So what the church documents say, in particular, the general instruction for the Roman Missal for the third typical edition, which is the one that we use today. And so I'm going to pull from that and other sources. And so that's the kind of the, the what we're going to be doing tonight. So let's look at some key points from the general instruction from the Roman Missal. And I think it's also important to note a little bit of the, the history here, and that is the fact that if you look at where we are today with regard to the, the, uh, the liturgy, and in particular, the liturgy of the word, we're in a very different place today than, they were, than we were prior to the Second Vatican Council liturgical reforms. If you recall, if you can remember that far back, with the, with the uh, previous uh, rite, we didn't really have that much of a liturgy of the word. It was there, but it was in a much smaller form. Uh, there was an epistle that would be read, and the priest or deacon would read the gospel, and that was pretty much it. And the lectors, the lay lectors, there really wasn't a role for lay lectors. And so that changed uh, under the Second Vatican Council. And what they did was they restored... Uh, that which had been sort of suppressed, not suppressed, it's not the right word, but it had fallen into disuse. And for a lot of valid reasons, which we won't go into, but there was a reason why, you know, they couldn't rely on a bunch of folks uh, in the pews to do those things because literacy was not a thing in large portions of the history of the church. And so it was only later as people got, you know, more literate, and especially here in the West, that the proclamation of the word became more and more essential. But today, we have this long experience now of having a full liturgy of the word and a liturgy of the Eucharist, two separate liturgies in one act of worship. And I want to talk about that too in a little bit, because they're so deeply and intimately connected, you can't really talk about one without the other. And it's extremely important that we get the connection because we need, we need to be the bridge from the liturgy of the word to the liturgy of the Eucharist. We need to help that open, we need to help open that up for people so that they do see and feel and experience the connectedness between the two liturgies, the altar of the word and the altar of sacrifice, because those two things inform each other. And without them, we're, we weaken our, our experience of the word. We also weaken our experience of, of Eucharist if we if we don't have a, a firm grasp and a deeply rooted love for the scriptures. And that's where you all come in. So in the general instruction of the Roman Missal, and now those are the directions that we have in the what we used to call the sacramentary, it tells us how to do things for liturgy. It specifically talks about the sacrificial nature of the Mass uh, that it the Last Supper, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood, by which the sacrifice of his cross is perpetuated until he comes again. So in the new missal, the rule of prayer, or we call the lex orandi, uh, of the church corresponds to our perennial rule of faith, which is called the lex credendi. So lex orandi, that's the rule of prayer. Lex credendi, the rule of faith. In other words, the way we pray affects what we, how we believe. And so it's important that we do it in a way that the church intends so that people come away with what we want them to come away with, right? We want them to really hear the message and internalize the message, and it needs to be clear to them, uh, by which we're truly taught that the sacrifice of his cross and the sacramental renewal, which the Lord instituted and commanded his apostles and us to do in his memories, are one and the same. So it's a, it's a very important responsibility. So by virtue of the change that occurred with the Vatican Council reforms, the royal priesthood of the faithful is now re-emphasized, where maybe it was, it was under-emphasized in decades past. When that came about, what was really being said was the people of God, everybody in the assembly, including the priest, we all have a role to play. I have a role to play. The deacon has a role to play. The acolytes have a role to play, the lectors, the assembly. We all have our specific and distinctive roles to play. And each of us needs to do it as well as we possibly can. And so all of that is to say that all of the faithful 
as one body, share in the Eucharistic sacrifice and share in the, in the activity of the worship as well. So uh, the celebration of the Eucharist is the action of the whole church and each of us should carry out only but totally that which pertains to us in virtue of the place each of us has within the people of God. The result is greater uh, of this is that greater consideration is given to some aspects of the celebration that have been sometimes accorded less attention in the centuries. And that would be, they're talking about the liturgy of the word. That the liturgy of the word was not heavily emphasized in, pre, in certain centuries. And so now we're getting, we've been getting back to that. And we still have a ways to go, but it's very clear that the fruits of this new thing that we're doing with this expanded lectionary, the three-year cycle, the two-year weekday cycle, the fact that we have more reading options than ever before, that because of all of that, access to the word of God is now considered normative rather than exceptional for Catholics. You know, the people can say, oh, Catholics don't really know the Bible. Yeah, we do. We just don't know that we know. <laughs> And so it's important to realize, you know, and also the fact is the, the, a lot of the churches, not Catholic churches, but Lutherans and Anglicans and others, they saw what we did in reforming and restoring our lectionary, and they took uh, their cue from us, and they, what they have now a revised standard lectionary, which is used across most of the mainline Protestant churches, which very, clear, very closely matches uh, the lectionary that we use. There are some variations, of course. Obviously, they're probably not, not going to do a feast for Mary, the mother of God, although we wish they would. And of course, one day they will, either here in the, or in the, the heavenly liturgy. But in any case, there are some minor differences. But the, that's an amazing thing to think about, that what, one of the, one of the uh, um, deep and abiding fruits of this liturgical reform, especially with the liturgy of the word, is some, something of an unintended consequence because we find that where we cannot find common ground with our separated brethren, you know that's how we refer to uh, Protestants now. We don't call them heretics anymore. Stop calling them heretics, right? They're separated brethren, right? So we're, 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 we're family, but uh, we haven't been talking with each other very well over the centuries. So the separated brothers and sisters, uh, th they... Now, they share with us a lot of the Word of God Sunday to Sunday, and that didn't exist before. And so this is a great thing, because whereas the Liturgy of the Eucharist, sadly, has, it still cannot unite us as believers, but the Liturgy of the Word can. And it's a beautiful thing, and it's a great, I think, first step in what winds up becoming, down the line, the reconciliation of the churches. That's going to happen. Sometime. We'll probably be dead before it comes around, but it will happen. And this, this one thing, this, this, this bringing of the word of God uh, uh, preeminently back into our liturgy has, has paved the way for steps that you and I can't even imagine right now. And so it's a, it's a great sign of the fruit, spiritual fruitfulness that is occurring because of the sharing of the word of God. So it's a very important ministry probably more than you thought. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, back to the general instruction. So you and I know this, um, but as we're celebrating the mass in which the sacrifice, is perpetu facts or sacrifice of the cross is perpetuated, Christ is truly present in the assembly. I think you probably know the four present, the four ways that Christ is present in the liturgy, right? You've heard that before? Not, not if you've heard that before. I see a head nodding. I see a couple more. Okay, so the four would be, let's see, like, can I put you to the test? You nodded. Somebody, now he's not nodding. All of a sudden he's like, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> okay, anyone take a guess? At least one of those four. The real presence of Christ in the liturgy is found in? In the word. Yeah, well, you figured that was coming, right? Okay, in the word, that's correct. In the Eucharist, that's right. Two more. See it? The Eucharist would include the wine. Yeah. I know. It was a nice try. Say again? In the assembly? Excellent. In the assembly. And, and then lastly, the priest. That's right. Yeah. We're always last. So, yes. So, the word 
the Eucharist, the assembly, and the priest, because the priest is representing Christ, the eternal high priest. Uh, I think it's important we get that right in our own lingo, because I'm not celebrating my priesthood. I'm celebrating the priesthood of Jesus Christ, and I'm representing that. I'm not manufacturing it. I'm not creating my own version of it. And so you'll know, you probably know by now, I'm pretty much by the book. And I do that out of conviction and out of principle and what I was taught. You know, we don't, we don't manufacture the liturgy and we don't make it into our own creation. Uh, we, we do what the church intends. And so we always have to have this spirit of humility in our hearts when we're leading the assembly. And I would encourage all of us to remember that all of us, including the priests, the deacons, the bishops, everyone, and all of the people of God, we're all, as Jesus says, call no man your teacher. You have one teacher. All of you are students. You're all learners. Well, guess what? We're all students, right? So we're all on the same footing in that regard. We're always learning. And the time when you decide that you've learned everything is the time you start to die. So so realize that if you want to live longer, consider yourself a lifelong learner and a student of everything and try to learn as much as you possibly can. It's only going to enrich your life and it's going to enrich the life of others around you. So the sacred scripture, uh, well, you already know, we've talked about this already. We have the two main liturgies, right? Liturgy of the Word, Liturgy of the Eucharist. So they're so closely connected that it is really one single act of worship in, in the mass is spread the table of both God's word and of the body of Christ. And from it, the faithful are instructed and refreshed. So we want them to feel refreshed. We want them to feel like they've learned something when they walk away on Sunday or weekday. Um, are, do we, I'm imagining, are all of you Sunday lectors or are some just exclusively weekday? All Sunday? Okay, just the one? Oh, so it doesn't matter. Just like there'll be some variations with the weekday as opposed to Sunday, but I'm basically talking about Sundays. So, okay. Um, so the when the scriptures are read or proclaimed, I'm going to I'm going to get to proclamation here in just a second. When when the word is proclaimed, not performed, but proclaimed, and there's a difference. Uh, God Himself speaks to His people through that living word, and that word is alive and active and effective if we allow it to be that way. So there are certain things we need to do and certain things we need to not do in order to make sure that we're not the ones getting in the way of the proclamation of the word. The people need to be able to hear the word of God in order for them to be able to reflect on it themselves, in order for them to be able to internalize it, in order for them to be able to begin to interpret it. Now, of course, the priest comes in or the deacon and we preach on that and we help that process. But even in the proclamation itself, we need to make sure that we are not getting in the way of that reception of the word because there is definitely a grace. The grace is operating in the liturgy of the word, both in the proclamation and in the hearing. And this is true throughout the entire liturgy of the word. And I'll give you a quick example of what I mean by that. When I was... Um, uh, not quite as uh, humble as I am now. Uh, so <laughs> I'm so proud of my humility. So when I was not quite as humble as I am now, or what I had when I hadn't learned what I had when I didn't know, uh, I had I was really getting agitated with a particular priest who was in supply. He was a supply priest. He'd come in and help out at the parish I was pastor at on the weekends to help out and say in a couple of masses or at least one. And he had a very, he was older and he was kind of starting to slip a little bit and his homilies were not exactly barn burners. And you know, he, he kind of droned on and on and there never seemed to be a point. And I was thinking to myself, Oh my, I mean, in my own judgy way, I was going, how can anybody get anything out of that? I think I'm going to take him off the schedule. And then sure enough, that, day, that very day that that thought popped into my head, uh, and he had finished the Mass, and I was standing outside greeting people, and folks were coming out, shaking his hands, Father, thank you so much. That's exactly what I needed to hear today. So there's something about the Liturgy of the Word. There's something, there's a mysterious thing called the Holy Spirit <laughs> that is active and doing stuff that you and I uh, really 
just need to get out of the way and let the spirit do his thing. And so it, 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 it you might have the, the best homily or the most uh, professional sounding proclamation in the whole world. And you think that you really, you know, and it's good. You want to work on your craft and I want you to work on your craft. I want to work on my craft, but there's also the fact that we have to rest and, and, and take comfort and take consolation and have peace in the knowledge that the word of God is real <laughs> and it is alive and it's speaking to everybody from uh, in all times, in all places. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit somebody differently every single time. And I've seen this again and again. If you're talking, like I used to have a little, what we call a um, uh, group of priests, we'd get together and do what's called um, uh, um, Lectio Divina in preparation for the preaching. It's a way of l reflecting on the scripture. And then you share with each other and you kind of get from each other what you, what you picked up on in your reflection. And we would grow on that and we'd, we'd hear each other. And so we have five guys talking about the, listening to the word of God, reflecting on it, listening to it again, taking some more prayer time and then starting to open it up and you know, what did you pick up on? What did you pick up on, et cetera? And it never failed. And if there were, if there were four of us or five of us, there'd be four or five very different things that people picked up on. Never the same, never the same thing, always something different. And if there were, if there were a hundred, there'd probably be almost a hundred different perspectives as well. So the spirit of God is working in the heart of every believer uniquely. So be mindful of that. And so, and take confidence in that when you get up to proclaim, because these aren't your words. These are the words, right? So uh, you don't need to worry about that part of it. The Lord's prepared that for you. He's prepared the, the Eucharistic banquet for us to feast on of the bread and the wine, now the body and blood. He's also prepared the word on which the people can feast as well. And it's really good food. So don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's, it's going to get five stars in the Yelp review, so don't worry. So what I want you to do is think about this in how we're looking, how we're approaching. And I'm taking, some of these are taken straight from the general instruction right now. So I'm going to get into these kind of specifics right now. So when the word is being proclaimed, God is speaking. And so the words are to be listened uh, to reverently by everyone. And when we're doing it, when we're addressing the people, we want to make sure that our proclamation is clear, that it is distinct, that we pronounce everything correctly. Now, I know that you probably don't think this, but Californians do have an accent. I'm a Californian. I have a Californian accent, but I work on it because the Californian accent is a very lazy tongue. So we drop a lot of sounds, going, that sort of thing, or we'll drop the T's in words. What, what's up? There's no T there, you know. Uh, or or, or uh, what are you talking about with no T at the end? So a lot of times we just drop sounds. So what I'd suggest to you is, and this is what I heard from one uh, um, preaching uh, uh, teacher when I was in seminary, think of the consonants in the in your proclamation as being what you need to make sure you're pronouncing clearly uh, for for meaning uh, for for content if you will right uh, so it's clear and understandable what you're actually saying and then think of the vowels as being how you shape the feel of the word so you kind of feel think of it in those terms I remember I had a, a, a priest who had was not he wasn't raised here in the U.S., so he had a very thick uh, Asian accent, and he was one of my parochial vicars. And he kept on talking about how he loved being a Reese. And I thought he was talking about, like, Reese's Pieces, and it turned out he was trying to say priest, but it was very hard for him, with his background, with his language of origin, to pronounce what we call a plosive, which is that, you know, when you close the mouth, when you're starting or ending a word, it's very hard for the Vietnamese to do that. They have to train themselves to do that. And we have to train or maybe retrain ourselves to make sure that we're pronouncing nice and clearly and distinctly. We wanna make sure that we're projecting to the, to the back of the room. I know a lot of times people will tend to lean into a mic and talk softer, but that's not a good thing. It's great that we have 
the amplification, but you don't want to rely on it entirely. You want to get good projection. You want to be able to, we are always taught to, we're always taught to preach to the back of the room with or without the microphone. And of course you have to adapt according to the sound system that you're in and the way the sound works in your particular place of worship. But just project nice and forcefully with strength and with confidence uh, and clarity and emphasis, emphasis and meaning. So what I mean by that is, and I'm sure you guys, for a lot of you, this is probably just, I'm rehashing some things you probably already knew. But when you, when you, when you yourself as a minister of the word, are preparing to proclaim, you need to make sure that you yourself have taken the time to look at the readings. And I would say this, I would suggest this, uh, and I don't want to go too deep into this, but I think it's a really good exercise. And that is before you ever get to uh, how you're going to proclaim that particular scripture, don't do that. Don't go straight to how I'm going to do that. Uh, that's at the end. The beginning ought to be, let me encounter the word, <laughs> right? Let me, let me read it. Let me have maybe somebody else read it to me. Let me just sit with the word for a good amount of time and just let the word speak to me and maybe read it over a couple of times. So if you've ever uh, practiced um, uh, Lectio Divina, you know what I'm talking about. If not, go to Google, you'll find it. So, um, and do that before you get to the point where you actually start to think, okay, how am I going to phrase this? Or where's the emphasis on this particular sentence? You know, where's the main point? Uh, and, and what am I supposed to be hitting here? And, and what's the tone I'm supposed to be setting? Uh, is this something that is, is solemn? Is this something that's celebratory? Is this something that is, is, um, uh, is more mournful? Those are things that, uh, that come later, later after you've done the internal work of sitting with the word of God yourself and coming to a place where you feel like you've internalized it and it means something to you. Now, having done that, uh, we have, this is, and I think I should probably say being a lector is a little bit like a tightrope act because on the one hand, you want to proclaim with conviction and you want to proclaim from a place where you really have a, perspective. You have a sense that this is what it means to you. However, there's that, but there's also the fact that the assembly is out there waiting to receive this word for the very first time. So as you're doing this, as you're putting all these pieces together, you also want to think about not getting in the way of that by imposing your interpretation on, on such a level that it kind of becomes what we call in seminary, we call this a noise factor or a distraction. Like they're focusing on the way we're doing it and, how, and, and, and where we're coming from. And they're thinking about us rather than the word. So we want to, so it's, it's a bit of a dance because on the one hand, it's not performance. It is proclamation. They're two very different things, but certain elements are the same, right? So, so again, it's not like, it's not theater. It's not tryouts for the local community uh, uh, drama club or whatever. It's not storytelling. It's not. Uh, it's not Toastmasters, it's not any of those things, but there are elements of those things. Technically, there are some elements that need to be there so that it does have strength and it has conviction, uh, but it can never sound forced or theatrical. Does that make sense? You know, like, you know, it's not, we're not, uh, and as far as pace is concerned, most lectors sin by reading way too quickly. Uh, uh, but I think most of you, I haven't heard any lectors here lately anyway that I'm aware of who or who have that problem. It seems like everybody has a good, good measured pace so that every word is being pronounced distinctly. We're not running words together. Uh, we're not racing through the readings. We don't want to do that. We want to let the reading breathe, you know. And of course, the, uh, uh, and I think it's not just a matter of, yeah, I, so I was at a parish. I was preaching for the the uh, the nonprofit uh, Concern America. Some of you know what that is. So I was preaching uh, for one of their weekends in in the L.A. Archdiocese, and they, they had this really nicely crafted liturgy. It was very professionally done, mass to mass. But I noticed that in the lector's binder, where it had the part for the prayers of the faithful. 
uh, when it came to, uh, for the prayers of this community of faith, for the intentions of all here gathered, they had this thing in parentheses that said, pause five seconds. So <laughs> you, you can guess what happened next. <laughs> for all of our personal intentions that we hold in our heart, pause five seconds, we pray to the Lord. <laughs> well, you want to pause. You know, and you want like, you want to give you want to give the the liturgy you want to give the liturgy of the word especially room for reflection room for for mulling over chomping on the on, chewing on it you know uh, and and really digesting the words so that's why we have I think we have a really nice very natural pace that we do here I really like the way it flows here because the way that you 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 um, uh, you choreograph, for bat, lack of a better word, the way you choreograph it, there is that built-in time that sort of has this these lovely little pauses in between the readings and the psalm, between the psalm and the second reading, between the second reading and the gospel proclamation. It's lovely. And I think it's just about right, you know. And I, I, I like the fact that it doesn't drag, but it also isn't, people aren't racing through. And that's, that's an important thing to remember. Let the words speak for themselves. Do your part, but let the words talk to the people of God. So a loud and clear voice, it should correspond to the genre. Remember, you're going to be proclaiming things like that, that will be part of poetry, you know, uh, or you're going to be reading something that's part of this really um, uh, uh, amazing narrative, like the travels of Paul or, or, or Jonah or, or, or Job or Tobit, you know, for goodness sake. Tobit's coming up in the summertime. I pity the fool who's got one of his readings. Um, have you ever uh, been at a, at, a, at a summertime mass? It would be usually the first, Friday, the first, um, first week in January, in January, in June, when we're all away on retreat. Um, there's a reading from Tobit where he falls asleep. For some reason, he falls asleep in the heat of the day, uh, and he's, he's um, got his head back. Uh, leaning against this warm wall and for some reason he's sleeping with his eyes open right and the bird come the birds come and <laughs> mess up his sight <laughs> and and that's one of the readings and we're never here for that we're always away on retreat so i'm not sure how people respond to that but those are some weird things that happen in scripture and you just have to know how to go about doing it so it's not monotone, it's not dragging, it's not drudgery, it's not deadpan, um, but it's also not so uh, um, so wild that people begin to like uh, uh, like focus on on the style of the proclamation rather than what's being proclaimed. So okay, so we talked about uh, the manner of pronunciation, um, and a thing to note uh, that is in the missal, which you all probably don't see, but when we see in the rubrics, when it says things like the priest or deacon would say or proclaim, they're saying what they're meaning is, and this is in order of, of preference, there's, they're, they're, when, when, the word, when you see the word say or proclaim, it means, uh, primarily it means sing or recite. And so, uh, so that's why sometimes you hear some priests and or deacons will actually chant the gospel. Most do not. Uh, and, but some will do the opening and closing. They'll do like the Lord be with you and the gospel of the Lord, and they'll chant that and you'll respond with chant um, because we're trying to reclaim that tradition of, of chant, of sacred chant in liturgy. Um, but I'd say we're, we've got a long way to go as far as that's concerned. Um, but anyway, so that's that's something to be mindful of. In in the liturgy of the word, and we talked about the silence and the singing, we talked about the fact that the people are being nourished by the word. And then when all of that has happened and we've had that chance to break open the word, because remember the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist are in some ways parallel realities. Uh, they mirror each other in a way because you have a lot of preface to the gospel. The gospel is the high point of the liturgy of the word. And then when that is shared, then uh, when it's proclaimed, then the priest or deacon is supposed to break that open for you 
And in that, then he gives that to you. So like breaking and ble blessing, breaking and giving the, uh, uh, the, the communion, we're also uh, blessing, breaking out, uh, breaking open and giving to the people the word of God. Remember too, we just had this reading not that long ago, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And remember, were, they were saying after they recognized that it was Jesus, the resurrected Jesus who was, who was in, in their company when they went home with him, or he went home with them and took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it. And then immediately their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus and then he vanished. And they said to themselves, were not our hearts burning within us as we walked along the road and he opened the scriptures for us. So that's what we're doing when we're proclaiming the word of God. We're opening the scriptures for the people of God, hoping and praying that we're doing it in a way where people's hearts do begin to feel that like, oh, God is talking to me right now. That's the, that's the beauty of the living word of God. So, okay, with all of that, um, I also want to say a, a little bit about uh, how we do this, because the functions of the people of God, they, we need to be in union with this. And I'm going to leave this to you all, because I've already spoken for more than half an hour, I just realized, so I want to give us, I want to make sure we wrap up pretty soon here. So um, you, you, as a community, have ways of doing things. And what I would just suggest as you go forward and you continue your liturgical uh, formation together is to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Like I said, people have been formed in these ministries over many years, sometimes decades with different sorts of emphases, which sometimes leads to uh, divergent sorts of practices. Like some people will bow before the altar, before they bring the uh, book up to the altar. Some people don't. Some people will bow to the ambo after they have, finished the proclamation of the word, some do not. So there are some variations. They're minor, they're no big deal, but they do, they do show that there are some differences in the way that we approach our public ministry. I would love to see, and if, if it were up to me, <laughs> we would standardize it all so that everyone had agreed upon doing it the one particular way and find the way that best uh, expresses how we wanna do this as a family of faith. And your incoming pastor will probably have a lot to share in that regard as well. So I'm not going to prejudge it. You know, just to just to just put in the back of your heads that you want to develop a sense of unity within our practice and our gestures so that it seems uh, very clear that we're all uh, in agreement with one another on what's to be emphasized and how we're to show reverence. Because otherwise then it becomes a very singular very personal kind of thing. And that's not what we're doing. You know, we're not doing, this is my liturgy or this is my proclamation. Da, 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 da. It's, this belongs to the whole church. And so the more that we can bring all that together and show unity in our gestures and our actions, I think the, the more that's communicated, maybe not where people immediately say, wow, look how unified everybody is. But I think intuitively that's what they sense. Like everybody's on the same page and that, and that feels good. That feels like we've really actually thought about this stuff <laughs> and we're paying attention to it. And we're all wanting to do the same thing with the same amount of zeal and love for the, love for the worship. So this unity, this bodily, these bodily postures, these gestures should be observed together. So I'm gonna leave that to y'all to figure out as time goes on. And so um, I would also say there is an instruction here, and I want to mention it only because I brought it up earlier, and that is that um, uh, it does say, the instruction does say that that when the deacon is carrying the book of Gospels, when he gets to the foot of the altar, he will bow. It's not a profound bow. It's a, it's a simple bow, and a simple bow is a bow of the head. Uh, a profound bow is from the waist, and so when you are carrying something in procession, you just make a simple bow of the head, like a nod of the head, and then you move on. Uh, and so even though that's specified for the deacon, it doesn't say one way or the other whether the, uh, the lay minister, when there's no deacon to carry the book, when it's a lay minister carrying the lectionary, or the, uh, sac I'm sorry, the book of Gospels, it doesn't say whether they should do a bow or not. So I would leave that to your discretion. Uh, but agree to do the same thing. That would be my suggestion. Um, okay, uh, it does say, however, that when they reach the altar, the priest and the ministers all make a bow. Um, but again, I'll let you all figure out how you do that. I also want to say, and this is just kind of by way of point of interest, 
because I actually, <laughs> I didn't even know this till I reread the germ. It says here, now, uh, you know where I preach from, right? Pardon me, the ambo. Uh, and, I, and when they write these things down, they write them down in order of preference. So if it says, if he gives you options, the first option they give you is the preferred option. So uh, there, are, um, there are three places that are recommended for the, for the preaching. Uh, and so uh, how many want to guess what the, what the preferred place for preaching is? Who says the ambo? Okay. Anybody, any other ideas? No. Well, here's what it says. I, I, I won't leave you in suspense. The preferred place, according to the general instruction, is to preach standing at the chair. Standing at the chair. I've never done it. I didn't know. So, I mean, I read about it, but I didn't think it was the preferred way. Yes, sir. The which one? Oh, see, they're they're ahead of us. They're way ahead of us. Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah, we're behind the we're behind. So yeah, it's a and the and there's a reason for that because the chair is the place where you know you teach from. If you remember when Jesus now now you notice it says the priest would stand to preach. Um, the bishop, when he's preaching from the chair, he sits. Like Jesus sat. Remember, Jesus, whenever Jesus Jesus taught. He sat down and everybody listened to him. He didn't preach standing up. So, uh, but we, because we are uh, functionaries of Jesus and not the high priest himself, we would stand. Um, uh, un unless my, my knee is hurting, then I'll sit. So that's a different story. Anyway, so, okay, so that, those are all things just, just by way of, uh, of interest. I want to make a couple of quick comments here. I, there's a really wonderful website. I'd encourage you to go to it. And there's a lot of neat websites you can find on lecturing. I'm sure you probably have already looked through some things. But there's a really neat one called still, it's all one word, stillbearingfruit.com. I'm sorry I didn't write it down for you somewhere, but it's called stillbearingfruit.com. And it's got incredible resources just all kinds of articles, great, great helpful hints and suggestions, recommendations, uh, wonderful things to think about and work on, even techniques you can use to improve your projection, et cetera. There's all kinds of neat resources there. And, uh, and so, I, in fact, that reflection that I mentioned earlier about the way that the liturgy of the word is actually bringing Christians together, that was actually something I picked up when I was reading this particular, uh, I was reading an article uh, from the March 29th, 20, 20, 2004 edition of America magazine. That article referenced that, and I thought, wow, that's really, really cool. So uh, there, again, there's all kinds of great stuff about the effective proclamation of the word there, and I highly encourage you to do that. Again, um, uh, we're not going to get into the details or the, or the, the nitty-gritty tonight. That'll be for another time. I believe you have a how-to Thing going on uh, later on in like in June, correct? Is that right? In June. Okay, so that'll be more about the like the actual technical side of it. But I think it's always good to get a, a, some kind of a little bit of a refresher and a reminder of what it is we're doing and then why it's so important. It is absolutely important. The effective proclamation of the word is one of the most important ways that we can support the people of God and support their faith journey. Absolutely essential. If it's really done well, it changes lives. So thank you for your desire to serve in that capacity. And I do hope that uh, that you all continue in it as well. Um, I will take, a, I know we're running a little bit behind, but I will take a couple questions or comments before we move on. Yes. There's some things I could tell the teens, which would be important to tell them because it's unique to them. You are, oh, you're a teen at heart, so yes. So yes, well, here's what they don't want to do. One foot, other foot, leaning leaning on one foot. I'm reading from the letters of St. Paul to the Romans, brothers and sisters. They, they get so nervous reading in front of people 
that they just, they just lock in and they just mumble and they go fast. So slow down, just slow down, plant both feet on the ground, take your time. It'll be fine. <laughs> it is nerve wracking. I gotta say the first few times you get up there and to proclaim, I mean, the adrenaline is just coursing through. You're trying to stay as calm as you can, but the first few times, especially when you're young, it's just, you know, you, you, your, your brain's on fire when you're up there. So I get it. I had to be told to slow down when I was newly ordained and my first assignment, I was, I didn't know how fast I was going. And so at the end of one of the masses, one of the uh, nuns who was actually in the choir for that particular liturgy said, Father, I have to tell you this, you need to slow down. No one can understand you. And I thought, I can understand me. Why? <laughs> I know what I said. <laughs> yeah, we all need to do that. Yes. Well, I think as I was saying, it is a bit of a it's a bit of a tightrope act. It's not it's not performance, like I said, and it's and but it is proclamation. So there is a well, I could probably give you. I mean, I could I could try this if you want. Um, so uh, okay, so like I'll give you an, I'll give you an example of what not to do. How's that? That's a good start. But this is sort of like the extreme because I've heard this before. <laughs> One guy, very enthusiastic. You know, he was. You know, he was a young, young guy, and he, when I say young, I mean younger than me, <laughs> but he, you know, he was very on fire about being a lector and everything, but he just, he, he thought it meant that you needed to, like, really, you know, uh, put it in people's, you had to sell it, right? So he was doing that, um, <clears throat> that one canticle where it concludes, you know, that every tongue will proclaim the Lord, and every knee will we'll bend and proclaim, Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's exactly how he did it. Just like that. I was not, uh, I was not inspired. <laughs> I was taken aback. So he was excited. It was like, brother, let's just dial it down by about half. <laughs> so there is a proclamation that is, Again, I, like I say, if you if you if you if you get proper breathing control, if you're projecting your voice to the back of the room, and you're speaking to be understood in the back of the room, and you're slowing down and you're pronouncing every word distinctly, you're going to be fine. It's when you start to get into this thing where you're trying to interpret uh, that you can get into some bad habits, you know. And it starts to sound like you're like it's story time at, at, at the kindergarten, you know. And that's not a that's not a helpful sound because again it becomes a distraction, uh, or it sounds like again like you're trying out for the local community theater. Again, um, nothing wrong with community theater, but that's not what we're doing. So it's a it's a you have to find your you have to find your voice. You have to find your pace. Some of us probably need to need to crank it up a little bit, you know because maybe we're too uh, um, expressionless, and some of us maybe need to, 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 to cool down a little bit and just allow the words, just trust that the words themselves are, are, are alive and don't worry too much about, about trying to sell the reading. So I think that just comes with practice. And another thing I would suggest, which would be very helpful, which I, th I saw worked very well in other places, is if you have a really good core group of people that um, that are willing to help each other. Peer reflection is really, really good. So when I was at uh, St. Bonaventure in Huntington Beach, we had an excellent uh, lector, director, and he would, every Monday night at like 6 p.m., the church was reserved for the lectors. And any lector could come. And for whatever reading, either it was the, the coming Sunday or it's a couple weeks down the line, you could come and you could practice your reading in front of your peers and you'd get feedback from your peers as well. Now that sounds a little scary at first, but once you do it a few times, you get used to it because everybody's there. We're all there to help each other and we want everyone to succeed. So you, you, you really do support each other and you can, somebody will say, will say to you, you know, I didn't understand that sentence. I didn't hear what you said. It was all, it sounded like one word. Uh, 
And that'll give you the feedback you need to go, oh. The other thing I would do, and I have done, and I highly recommend it, and I don't necessarily need to know that you need to videotape yourselves, but I would recommend that you audio record yourself from time to time, just so that even though everybody hates to hear their own voice on recording, but this is just for your own use. And everybody has a recorder on their cell phone anyway, right? So you can practice in the privacy of your home and you can practice the reading and then you can go back and listen to it and see if it's the pace that you really want. And, if, if it, and maybe you'll find out that you haven't paused at all throughout the entire reading. Or maybe you find out that you are going faster than you thought. So it, it's a good tool for self-correction. And I think that's the main thing is just understand where you need to be and what you need to do in case you're not where you need to be and then work on it. And then, you know, um, the nice thing about, like, for example, the deacons, when they're preparing their, for their weekends, when they're uh, proclaiming and or preaching is they, they have like uh, uh, with their, with their wives, they have a great um, resource for, um, for immediate feedback. And they can practice the homily at home and then the wife is not going to lie. <laughs> She's going to be brutally honest. And I, I found that many of the deacons really found that to be very, very helpful to bring their spouse on board, you know, or someone from the home to, to, to listen. Um, and uh, and I, I found it, they found it very, very helpful. And in fact, so much so that there was a couple of guys who were really not that gifted in terms of preaching. And when they try to do their own homily, and this is early on when they were just getting started, and when they would try to preach, it was like, okay, that was all right, but it was sort of rambling, and I didn't didn't really understand what he was trying, what the main point was. Like, there were 12 points, and I'm not sure which one to focus on. And then every once in a while, he'd do this gem, and it was, like, concise and beautiful and clear, and there's a point to it, and he said that thing, and it was and it was just gorgeous. And <laughs> so he'd come back and sit down next to me, and i go, now, your wife wrote that one, didn't she? <laughs> Absolutely. Why not? You know, if it's good, use it, you know? So, and I think that's the other thing. If you find that there are certain public speakers that you like and their sound is something you'd like to emulate, try that, you know, try that, work on, work on that. Anyway, so we're already at, uh, at I think if I'm looking at that clock correctly, I can't tell cause it's so dark over there, but it's almost, oh, it's almost eight o'clock. All right. Well, I went well over time. So, um, are we, uh, we're, we're, finished at eight, correct? Okay. All right. Um, so I, I don't want to go any further unless there's anything very pressing that we really want to hit right now tonight. Okay. And then we do want to say that there are materials here for them. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. So I, when, when, and, and as if, as if, <laughs> have those been handed out or not? Okay. So when you pick them up, uh, you'll notice that among the other items you'll have there, uh, for not only the helpful hints uh, for electors, but there's also the guidelines for electors that was published by the diocese. And this document is there as well. And a lot of what I've just told you is contained in here, uh, but it'd be good to have it for you to, to refresh your, your, your reflection. And it's, it talks about the same, a lot of the same things I was mentioning you know, the ability to evoke faith in others by demonstrating your own faith, right? So it needs to be authentic, right? Your proclamation needs to be coming from you and, and, and not something artificial or manufactured. So people know the difference. They can feel it. So, okay. Um, anything else? Yes. Oh, like a site or something? Yeah, sure. For pronunciation of like, you're talking usually about like place names or proper names like Aminadab and ne Nebuchadnezzar and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, there are, I don't know if there are, there probably are. We have, yes. Oh, do they have a thing on pronunciation on there? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, got it. 
So you just take, you listen to the audio of the proclamation and then you can get a sense of how it's to be pronounced. That's good. Yes. Yeah, I think so. That's right. Your workbook's pretty extensive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Although, again, now going back to the workbook, that's very practical, but I would save that, that part. I would wait before I started piecing that together because they give you all like how to phrase it, where the pause is, where the emphasis is. They do a great job of that. I don't disagree with any of it, but I say, don't go there until you've had a chance to, to be in relationship with that word yourself. Once you feel comfortable that you have something to share, <laughs> then go and, and see if that resonates with you. You know, Use that for your technique rather than your own reflection. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. And where is this? Oh, that's true. You can find almost everything online now, you know. Yes. Net Ministries? Okay. And which one is this? Oh, sure. Just, yeah. You know, eventually I think the, the, the AI bots are going to take over everything, including including our jobs, so. <laughs> so at this great time, you know, because there's so much that's available now and it's so easy to access. Uh, so your proclamation, so no one has an excuse. <laughs> uh, there was a poor guy, but he was so nice, such a nice fellow, but he was a weekday elector and he always wound up with that reading that comes around, I forget what time of year it is. I think it's also a summertime reading. And it's the one about uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and the three men getting thrown into the fiery furnace. And the name uh, comes up like five times. And the poor guy, he'd, he'd always be the one, you know. And he was so, he had, he had a, a, a mental block about it because he'd be so nervous about it. And he'd see me in the sacristy saying, Father, how do you pronounce this name? And I would say, this little dance we did every single year. And I'd say, well, you can say Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't really matter. Just pick one and just stay with it. It doesn't matter. And, uh, I mean, we just we just give our best approximation. As long as it's close to that, that's fine. Um, so he'd be in the back, and I could hear him in his area practicing that one name, Nebuchadnezzar, 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 <laughs> just repeating it. And sure enough, the minute he got up there, he'd freeze. And when the, when, the, when the name came up in the reading, he'd have this hitch in his voice. Like suddenly, it was like, like suddenly he couldn't talk. This is this long pause. And then he'd go, ne ne Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. And every time he'd do the same thing. He would stumble and, and, and just sort of stammer through it. I thought, oh, this poor guy. Give him a break. Don't make him do that reading, you know, or call him, call him Nebi. I don't know. I mean, do something. But anyway, so uh, yeah, the, the pronunciation is, is we, we try to do our best with those biblical uh, sounds. Uh, and it always, it's always great when you, when you can make it sound as if it's, if it's actual Greek or Hebrew. Uh, the reality is we're probably just giving, we're, we're probably terrible at it. But it's our anglicized version. So, you know, just find one and enjoy it. All right. So anything else? Yes. Oh, very good. Okay. All right. We can talk about that real quickly. Yeah. So there are options, uh, and the options uh, will vary. Now, most times there aren't. For Sunday readings, anyway, there usually are not. On weekdays, there are often options, depending on what feast you're going to celebrate, if it's an optional memorial. And so the lectors for weekdays and Sundays, if there are options coming up on a Sunday, uh, the lectors should be aware of what those options and alternatives are going to be, because the presider may want to use one of those alternate texts. 
So if you do see a weekend where alternate texts might be used, make sure you become familiar with both sets of readings, just in case. That happened actually just the other weekend because the sixth Sunday of Easter, uh, because now we've moved Ascension from Thursday to Sunday, now the instruction says that if Ascension is celebrated on Sunday, not Ascension Thursday, then the priest may choose to use the second reading and the gospel from the seventh Sunday of Easter because you're not going to hear those readings because the Feast of the Ascension has its own readings and you're not going to hear the readings from the seventh Sunday of Easter. So we, so that was an option. It was available this last weekend. Um, and I know, it, I know it threw some people off, but that's okay. It's good to be thrown off once in a while, you know, keeps us all humble. So, uh, so yeah, so be mindful of when options exist and, and be sure that you've prepared both. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? You have no further business? Okay, just make sure you take your materials. And everybody had to sign in, right? So if you have not yet signed in, make sure you do that. Okay, and let's stand and let's do, uh, do a concluding prayer. I can't believe it's already been an hour. That's, that's, that went really fast for me anyway. <laughs> it might have dragged for you, but it went really quickly for me. I'm in hog heaven when I can do this kind of stuff. It's much better than sitting behind a desk all day long. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of our ministry. We thank you for the gift of your sacred word, which you've entrusted to your church for the proclamation of the mystery of faith the death and the resurrection of your son. May we always embrace that sacred mystery and may we proclaim it by what we say and do. And may the word always be alive in our daily walk and may it be clear to others uh, what we believe and who we believe in through your sacred word. And we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, you guys, thank you. All right, thank you.